Here we're going to recap the second big idea of ESS topic 1.4, sustainability. And that significant idea that you see right here on the screen is that sustainable development means meeting the needs of the present without compromising or reducing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We're looking at sustainable use of natural resources. This is where natural capital and natural income come into play. Great. Your first understanding statement from the syllabus is this big long thing here. Factors such as biodiversity, pollution, population, or climate can be used quantitatively as environmental indicators of sustainability. These factors can be applied at a range of scales from local to global, millennium ecosystem assessment, blah, 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 blah. It's way too much information to remember as written. So let's break it down into smaller bits and look at it piece by piece. All right. First, biodiversity, pollution, population, or climate can be measured. We can get quantitative numbers from them and use those to indicate sustainability. That's why they're called environmental indicators. Right? And there's a bunch of different ways to measure or assess those indicators, right? Biodiversity. We previously looked at how biodiversity, the, the more diversity we have, the stronger an ecosystem is, the more resilient it is to change. So greater diversity means greater ecosystem stability, which means it's more sustainable. Well, how do we measure biodiversity? We'll get into that when we get to ESS topic 2.5 in a few weeks, right? There's a tool called Simpson's Diversity Index. It's a mathematical model that you can apply from your field measurements, and I'll teach you how to do that. Pollution. This is something that humans put into the environment that has an adverse or negative impact on the environment, generally affecting the abiotic factors which then subsequently influence the biotic factors of the environment, right? So the less pollution there is, the lower the impact there is on living organisms. Therefore, that's more sustainable. Our next topic in the syllabus is called humans and pollution. So we're going to look at some of the ways to measure pollution in that topic. We'll also touch on it in the, the subtopic dedicated to water pollution in topic four that will come up later this year. Populations, right? Similar to Simpson's diversity index, right? We can measure populations. But in this case, we're looking at initially human populations, right? The more people there are on the planet, the more resources we typically consume. So more people means more pressure, which means that's less sustainable. Since we're talking about assessing the environment, if we look at plant or animal populations or populations of other organisms that are not people, generally speaking, the more stable an ecosystem is, right? The greater the populations are, the greater diversity you have within those populations due to genetics, that means the ecosystems are more stable and you have a more sustainable approach. Right? We're going to look at some tools about both of those. Um, ecological footprint is going to come up in just a few minutes, and then we're going to revisit it at the end of the course when we go into topic 8.4 about humans and resource use. Right? Climate might be challenging for us in a high school setting to measure or assess directly, right? But there are, there's a lot of data that professional scientists are gathering that we can use to assess sustainability of different human actions, right? The number one indicator there are levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right? If we have stable levels of greenhouse gases, the greenhouse effect that provides for life on our planet remains stable. It doesn't lead to a runaway positive feedback mechanism called climate change, right? Stable greenhouse gases create stable global temperatures. That's a more sustainable approach, right? As we change 
the greenhouse gases, that changes the environment. And it's the environment that determines which organisms survive. So we'll revisit that concept from evolution when we get into topic three about the origins of biodiversity and how the environment applies that selective pressure to determine who lives and who dies. Right? All of those environmental indicators, right? Biodiversity, pollution, populations, and climate, we can apply those on a global scale. We can also apply them on a very narrow basis at a local scale. Right. Understanding statement number five is that the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, or MA for short, right, gave a scientific appraisal or a measurement of trends in the world's ecosystems and the services that those ecosystems provide to people. Right. So the purpose of it really was to figure out how people are impacting the planet. The major takeaways here, I've written them in red, more diversity loss in the past 50 years than at any other time in human history. We may have increased the wealth and health of human populations, but doing so has come at the expense of the ecological goods and services that we discussed previously in topic 1.4 about natural capital and natural income, right? That natural capital is being harvested unsustainably, right? We're taking more than the income every year. So we're drawing down on that account, that standing stock of natural capital every year. Right? And remember the first law of ecology is that everything is connected to everything else. So if we are taking down or drawing down our stock of natural capital in the environment, that's ultimately going to lead to harm to human populations. This is environmental systems and societies. Our societies are a part of and interdependent with environmental systems. Sustainable solutions are possible to all of these issues, but they do require international coordination and collaboration, which is quite challenging. The next big idea in topic 1.4 is that environmental impact assessments are important for sustainable development. Let's look at the name of this thing. It's an assessment means to measure. So we want to measure the environmental impact of our actions, right? That's what an EIA does. It's how do we measure the environmental impacts of what we're doing, right? EIAs are going to be different depending on the size of the project, depending on which country it takes place, but they all follow a fairly basic or a fairly similar structure, right? First, you undergo a baseline study, right? To figure out the current state of the environment before the project begins. And we're looking at environmental impacts, we're looking at social impacts, we're looking at economic impacts. So we measure the current state of things. Then we start planning. If we want to go ahead with a project like a dam or a major road or some other type of big infrastructure project, right? We know that it's going to have environmental impacts. We know that it's going to have social impacts. We know that it's going to have economic impacts. Well, how do we reduce the environmental impacts? How do we make it so that the social impacts or the economic impacts are beneficial to a majority of the people? Then, assuming we've come up with a good plan, we implement the plan, we say, here's how the, this is the plan that's been approved. Let's follow along with it. Let's continue to measure it and monitor how that's happening. And then the final stage over here says assess and that's monitoring and evaluation, right? Were the impacts that we predicted back here actually as we predicted that they would be? Do we need to change the project as a result of impacts not being what we predicted? Right? An EIA is a tool that 
decision makers like governments um, and big developers can use to, de to determine the scope of the impact of the, one of their projects. In some places, it's not a government requirement. In many places, it is. And, and frequently, because governments generally represent people and other organisms have less of a voice in government or big business decisions, the socioeconomic factors generally will prevail over many of the environmental factors. That's not always the case. That is a generalization, but that is frequently true. One of the things you're going to need to do in this topic is evaluate EIAs. So here's one step to that, or here's one part of that. Right? Criticisms of EIAs is that there is no such thing as a standard practice for an environmental impact assessment. An environmental impact assessment for a dam project in Cambodia is going to be very different from an environmental impact assessment for a uranium mine in Tanzania, which will be very different from a proposed shrimp or prawn farm in Vietnam. It's also quite difficult to define the system boundaries. Again, back to this idea that everything is connected to everything else. If everything is connected to everything else, an impact on one part of the system is bound to have knock-on effects in the connected parts of the system. So those could be considered indirect impacts. And how do we assess those? We know they exist, but to what extent and how far out do we continue to measure them or assess them? Here's another tool that decision makers can use to guide their planning process as part of an environmental impact assessment. It's called an ecological footprint, All right? This is an area of land and water that is theoretically required to provide everything that we need to stay alive sustainably. That means indefinitely, right? If the, in, if the ecological footprint is greater than the area available to a particular population, then that means the population, their habits of resource use and consumption are not sustainable, right? Ecological footprint is a theoretical model. It's not an actual measurement of the amount of land that's dedicated to farming and the amount of land that is built up into cities and roads. It is not a measure of the volume of water that is consumed for human use and agricultural irrigation. It's a model, right? And it's a model that's a function of the habits and resource consumption of a person or more broadly of populations, right? Again, it's a theoretical model. It's how much stuff we use, how many resources we use in order to stay alive for a year. This is gonna come back to the idea of renewable and non-renewable resources. We need to give those resources time to renew themselves for new fish, new animals to be born and to mature. We need to give the environment time to absorb our pollutants, our greenhouse gases, the carbon that we're emitting. We need time for those forests to grow and pull that carbon out of the atmosphere. We need time to allow nutrients to be replenished in the soil. Right? So the ecological footprint comes back to not only the, the idea of sustainability, but this idea of renewable versus non-renewable natural capital. We've seen this relationship between natural capital, natural income, and sustainability already, right? When looking at what are these values, what's the value of ecosystem services to society? I mean, we've, just, we've just looked at, we need time to allow things to happen, such as carbon sequestration or fish populations to restock or to regrow. Right? How much would you pay for those ecological services? How much is oxygen worth to you? Can you put a dollar value on that? All right. 
you may be tasked to evaluate or discuss how environmental indicators, such as that Millennium Assessment, can be used to measure the progress of a project or to measure how sustainably something is happening. Right? If you're going to evaluate something, you're going to have to weigh the pros, weigh the cons. And if you're going to look at the progress of a project, you need to know where it started. That's your baseline study. You need to know where things are during and after the project. That's your environmental monitoring. You need to know what to measure. Those are your environmental indicators. And you need to know how to measure them. We'll get into some of those when we get into topic 2.5, investigating ecosystems in just a little while. You'll also be asked to evaluate the use of EIAs. And they won't ask you to evaluate a particular environmental impact assessment. More, you, know, you might be tasked with evaluating the concept of an environmental impact assessment more holistically. Right? What are the strengths of it? Allows us to assess sustainability. What are the limitations? Well, it's not carried out the same way everywhere in the, everywhere in the world. One of the limitations may be that even though we've identified that a project will have negative environmental consequences, the social and economic benefits of that project may be determined to um, outweigh or outstrip the environmental concerns. And so the project goes ahead anyway. And you should be able to, to look at both sides of that argument. All right. Explain the relationship between ecological footprints and sustainability. I just want to come back and remind you, the ecological footprint is a model. It's a theoretical tool to assess sustainability. We're looking at how much do we need to stay alive year after year based on our resource use habits. Okay. International mindedness, right? Your environmental impact assessments, they, they're different depending on where they are, right? We have all these COP summits that are happening. The intention is to develop tools and treaties and agreements to help monitor and assess human impacts on the environment. So these international conferences are kind of like giant environmental impact assessments, right? And they incorporate a lot of baseline knowledge from a wide range of fields. All right. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give it a like, consider subscribing to my channel and share it with other people. Thanks.